was good. Let's go on with our workshop. And now it's the turn of Julian Leonard with the Frontiers Quantum Simulations with Optical Lattices. Yeah, uh, thank you very much. Um, and uh, thank you uh, to the organizers for, uh, organizers for having me here. Um, it's been fantastic so far. And thank you all for, um, for listening, for being here. Um, my talk fits uh, actually perfectly in with the uh, introduction that uh, Anna gave this morning um, on, on quantum simulations with optical lattices. Um, and uh, this is the one platform for quantum simulations that I've been working on um, during my uh, time as a postdoc in the group of uh, Marcus Greiner at Harvard. So this is, these results that I'm going to present are mostly um, from there. Um, and I would also point out when we had some overlap with uh, machine learning techniques which we um, used to interpret or better understand our data sometimes. Um, so um, afterwards, or since, since uh, recently, I've started my uh, own group at, at TUV, so that's um, also why you can see the affiliation there. Um, and I'll also briefly show you what we are um, up to there, um, which I think also fits very well within this uh, workshop here. So in general, when you're looking into performing quantum simulations, um, there are two different reasons why we want to do that. Um, the first one is, to, uh, is, a, is a more technological interest, so we have certain platforms that we would like to understand better to use them for, for example, industrial applications. That includes um, uh, having, for example, better um, materials, high, high temperature superconductors, having better sensors, better quantum technologies. So ha being able to compute some problems, compute with a physical platform some problems, um, would help us to solve those, those technolo technological issues. On the other hand, there's also fundamental interest because, um, of course, we also want to know how these systems behave um, from a very physics point of view. So there's an intrinsic value for us to understand that. And that also means that we often want to go beyond what is actually physically relevant and now study models or parameters, uh, parameters that uh, are outside of the physical reality. Um, so that can, of course, um, be useful to benchmark certain numerical techniques to have a better understanding which physical eff effects are actually at play here. So they go beyond of a uh, pure uh, uh, of, well, computation of a physical system um, for this industrial ap application, but actually also from a very fundamental point of view. And there are um, several sort of ways how we do, do deal, the, deal with these, and always it starts from very, very well understood um, fundamental building blocks. So we want to understand our individual Lego blocks, and we want to um, then combine the interactions. And once we understand the individual one, one once we understand the, the, the rule with which we can build, bring two together, um, we hope that the complex structure that we will find at the end is something that we will observe and that we can trust because we understand the individual rules very well. And there are several platforms that I want to highlight here. Of course, there's more, but there's a few key players here. Um, one are the uh, trapped ions that have been very successful uh, early on. The optical lattices, which um, uh, use uh, neutral atoms in the, in the, in the lattice. Um, also, Rydberg atoms and tweezers, which uh, have been, become very prominent over the last years, have, uh, have uh, also working with, with neutral atoms. And then we have uh, superconducting devices. And this talk here will mostly be about optical lattices. It's also a little bit about tweezers, not, not so much about Rydberg, but a little bit about tweezers. So um, this is essentially what we, are, what we are going to talk about today. And these are both dealing with neutral atoms. So you can really tell that neutral atoms are really one of the very promising platforms in general to, to um, access quantum simulations uh, uh, in uh, today's, uh, today's physics. Um, in this talk, I want to um, talk about three different things. First, I will give you a little bit of an introduction how this actually works with uh, um, the, in, uh, like essentially our, our version of, uh, of quantum simulation with neutral atoms. I know you already got a very nice introduction by Francesca last week, at least those who were here last week. Um, so I'll, I'll keep it short and uh, focus on what's, what's special for our system. Um, and afterwards, I want to talk about two different um, kind of problem sets that uh, mimic a little bit these two different approaches that I mentioned before. One is a bit more condensed matter oriented to actually understand how certain um, material properties can work and, and that, uh, that's where optical lattices originally started from and where they're very powerful. And the second one will show you how with a little bit more of a programmability you can actually also um, study phenomena that maybe go beyond a pure material science <coughs> application and have a more fundamental interest. Good, let's, let's just start, start right away. Um, the, the, the key to having a good quantum simulator is that you start with an excellent uh, initial state preparation, that you have control over how you want to evolve the state, which means that you have control over ma uh, as many possible um, Hamiltonians as possible. And then finally, that you, and this is 
What's going on here? I think we are run out of battery. Okay, I think ICTV wants me to do a Blackboard talk now. Okay, we will see. Um, and, and the third thing is that you can read it out with a high fidelity. And um, uh, luckily, with um, these neutral atoms, we can build on this huge toolbox that quantum optics has been pro provided us, or all the, all the quantum opticians of the last half century have, have developed for us. And um, so we can prepare these states with a really, really high fidelity. Um, can stay, uh, we, can, we, can, we, can, we can prepare them by optical pumping and cooling techniques. We can then, um, for the evolution, we have a very, very high control over potentials because these atoms are always attracted or repelled by lasers. And so proportional to the intensity, we can build a, a, a potentials. And that's very, very useful. Um, we can also control the interactions um, with actually a, a range of techniques that we've been developed, for example, flash buffer resonances, photon mediated interactions, virtual interactions, dipole dipole interactions. So there are many, many different ways. And then we can have a very high resolution state, re state readout down to the individual degrees of freedom of the atoms with fidelities. I think the record now is 4.9, 99.99 uh, detection uh, whether there's an atom at a given position or not. So with extremely high fidelity, we can also now read out all the microscopic degrees of freedom of these systems. Um, so a very nice toolbox that we are going to use. There's um, a few, a few um, challenges here. So one is that, uh, well, these atoms, you have to first make them actually interacting. Do we have actually useful useful, uh, uh, well, quantum simulator that needs some interactions. Um, and then also the second part is something that was very uh, challenging for the last decade or so for our community to get to the point where you have individual control over all these large numbers of atoms. So having large number of atoms is something that's easy. I pointed this out here on the left. So actually it's fairly easy to have th hundreds of thousands or even 10,000 of atoms. Um, what's the difficult part is, can I also get to the point where I have microscopic control over each of those atoms? Um, so I think that's, that's kind of the, the balance that we've been learning a lot over the last 10, 15 years. In our system, this is what it looks like. Um, so you can see here the, the, this little line here separates the vacuum chamber from outside. And in this cartoon, you really find that there's uh, essentially a microscope that is half, halfway outside the vacuum, half inside the vacuum chamber. So the last lens of the vacuum sits in, uh, last lens of the microscope sits inside the vacuum chamber, and then the physics happens right underneath this microscope lens. So that, uh, right underneath this last lens, and we can use it in both ways. We can use light uh, that we focus down in arbitrary patterns by shaping this light this light beam up here with the DMD. We can um, create arbitrary patterns here, and in particular also this optical lattice, but also um, variations thereof there on top of that. Um, and then we can also collect fluorescence uh, from the atoms and actually image these atoms. And can, you can see here the pictures. And um, if you, uh, so here, here's, here's a bare picture. And uh, the, the, this is a zoom in. And then you can binarize this. And with the high fidelity, we know which, which site was occupied or not. So these are techniques that are by now 10, 15 years old. So that's not something very new. But this is exactly how we do it in our experiment um, that uh, yeah, is, is a tool set here. And I mentioned earlier that atom numbers are not intrinsically a problem. Um, so here you can see what it looks like if you load all the, all the atoms in our system. So these are now uh, tens of thousands of atoms. And um, you can zoom in, and it's, it's indeed the shot that I showed you before. So each, each side here is on the letter side is either occupied or not occupied. So it's a projective measurement that we take of these pictures, of these atoms. So the measurement is projective. That's not projective. That also means that the wave function that we evolve at the end will be, in, a, in general, in an entangled superposition. So it could be that we detect the atoms like this, or like this, or like this. So also, it's always the same quantum state. Each individual outcome will, will look different. I sometimes call this the snapshots in this talk. I will call it the snapshots of our quantum state. So if we realize our system once, and we take a snapshot, of course, the, atom, the state will be um, projected um, into one particular Fox state basis. Uh, and then I throw away the state. I restart over, and I will prepare the exact same state evolve it, and since I have the exact same state, my next uh, measurement will be just a different projection of the same psi. So this is in general how it works. Um, this allows you to um, access a lot of uh, par uh, parameters, a lot of observables, um, starting from density correlations. And density is, of course, first order correlations, but also higher order correlations in the densities. You can also measure lo local currents. And you can also even um, access more complex observables, such as entanglement entropy, quantum state purity, and others. So there's a huge um, range of observables that are addressable with these kind of systems due to the single site manipulation and detection <coughs> techniques that we have. Yeah, so with this, um, I'm finished with my introduction. I hope we are all on the same page now, what, how, it's, how it's going to continue. Um, let's uh, continue with the uh, solid state uh, 
phenomena that we're looking at, and this is something where the optical lattice is actually original, originally, were, this was the original motivation for, for building optical lattices. And this stems from this analogy that uh, in a solid we have the ionic cores of the particles and the valence of electrons can now hop from side to side in this potential that's formed by the, by, by the ions of, this, of, of, each at, of each atom that the, that the solid is assembled from. And we have here very small length scales on the order of angstroms, very, very, small, um, very small time scales, of course, because these electrons will hop very quickly now. Um, and accordingly, you can afford to be at fairly high temperatures, fairly high means in the Kelvin regime, to actually see um, physics there. And uh, in contrast, in optical lattices, we can just get rid of the ionic cores and we say, okay, this is the static potential that electrons move in and this is what gives me, in the end, all my transport properties. So I, I create this by a standing wave optical potential um, and this is now in which I place my atoms and this could, for example, now be fermionic atoms that move now from side to side again by hopping, um, uh, by tunneling uh, from, from side to side and then they interact. Um, and in this case, now my lattice constant is much, much larger than in the solid my time scales accordingly are much, much slower, so it's accessible with standard electronics, um, and my densities accordingly also are, of course, much, much lower. And what this means is that if my densities are lower now, um, my temperatures also have to be much, much lower to have a comparable, uh, to have a comparison to solids. And this is something uh, that we are still struggling with to actually reach exactly those temperatures. We are still a little bit higher, but uh, we are still, we are cold enough for a lot of phenomena, but for, but for some of the solid state phenomena, phenomena, we are not quite cold enough yet, and this is an ongoing, ongoing work. But um, overall, we are, we are in a similar regime, so there are different quantum regimes. The De Broglie wavelength is much, much larger, but in the end, comparable uh, in the same, like comparable to the lattice constant in both cases in the same way. And so therefore, this is a, a system that is just much more controllable, much more, much more manageable um, than a solid, but uh, in terms of the physics, we should expect the same results. And this is one of the early results that were obtained when people started to load fermionic atoms in these lattices. And here, if you increase the interaction strength, you start here from a metal to a band insulator where, where, you, where you can see that each atom, each side has exactly two particles. Uh, in this case, um, they show up as, as empty. So since these are fermionic uh, um, atoms of two spins, that means there's exactly um, one spin up and spin down on each side. And then in, if you increase the interactions, then these particles, they start to repel each other, so they're not on the same side anymore. And instead, we end up with a mod insulator, which is uh, charge ordered, so exactly one side, uh, each side occup occupied by one atom. And then people started to look into uh, also uh, magnetic ordering. And by lowering the temperature below the super exchange, you can now um, um, look at the the um, antiferromagnetic magnetic case, and indeed, if you then look at this, at this spin ordering here, you find these kind of nice spin correlations that, as a, as a function of the distance, you find this nice uh, checkerboard pattern of ups, ups and downs um, of, of, the, of the spin correlation here. So a big step towards uh, simulating real, real solids, but as I mentioned again, um, we are not really quite cold enough here to go all the way down to the, to the regime, maybe to explore this full phase diagram here. Um, what we now did in our experiment was to add a different flavor to this by going towards magnetic phenomena. And this is something that's a little bit counterintuitive because, um, of course, the difference between, our, between real electrons and our neutral atoms is that our neutral fermions, they, or atoms, they would just repel each other through, to, through um, S-wave collisions, whereas electrons actually repel each other due to their charge. And so our atoms, since they're not charged, they will also not see a Lorentz force, so there should be no effect um, to a magnetic field. But there are um, tricks how you can do that. And and essentially what happens is that you engineer a pile space through a Raman process that uh, is different on each different lattice site or on each different um, pair of lattices, uh, of lattice sites. And that means that if I now hop on a little plaquette here, I can accumulate a phase that is identical to the phase I would accumulate in a, in a pile space, so like an electron on a, on a lattice, on a, on a solid, in a solid state lattice. And it's even possible to, to tune this at a role, so you can really go from zero magnetic field to all the way to essentially infinite magnetic field. And I, I put here like larger than 10,000 Tesla because this would correspond to a pi phase on an individual, on an individual plaquette. So there's no point in going beyond that. So essentially you can, re, re, uh, you can reach all kinds of magnetic fields that you could even, not even dream of in a, in a solid state system. So um, that allows us now to, because it's a new tool, to also look at magnetic phenomena. And um, one of the first things we were starting to look into was a Laughlin state. 
Duffin states are the paradigmatic uh, class of uh, states that describe fractional quantum Hall physics. And what I do in a very nice way is that they, um, are, they are very strongly correlated and they combine both the cyclotron motion that uh, a magnetic field would like to imp imp impinge on, the, on these atoms and at the same time repulsive uh, energy, uh, uh, kinetic, uh, excuse me, uh, uh, <laughs> interaction energy um, by bringing these particles apart. And you can see that if you just would take a snapshot of a, of a Laughlin state, so this is a, uh, just a simulation where you see that normal particles, if they would just uh, repel, it, uh, even if they would repel each other, they were still somewhat, somewhat random here. So this would be a, a non-topological state, not a Laughlin state, but maybe, for example, a superfluid state. Whereas in a Laughlin state, you can see that particles tend to try to be far apart from each other. So there's, there's some, some correlation going on where particles, they don't want to be close to one another, but a little bit farther. And in the Laughlin ray function, this is incorporated by a kind of an, a cyclotron motion um, uh, where, which particles do around each other. So you can really think of the Laughlin state as one, as a state in which um, all pairs of particles dance around each other. So each particle is in its position of encircling all other particles. And therefore, it actually has its cyclotron motion in, built into the wave function. But at the same time, also, it never meets another atom because it's always going around the other one. And therefore, the interaction energy is also minimized. So that's why it's such a good state, and it's also, um, well, it turns out to be a ground state, actually. <laughs> and uh, so that's, uh, that's important. And it's, uh, it's a good state because it's very simple. And it's a very simple ansatz, and that's, that's also uh, uh, very influential about this. And we were thinking, how can we prepare something like that in our, in our system, now that we have the magnetic field built in? And uh, <clears throat> our first approach was to say, okay, let's, put the, uh, let's take the smallest system possible and then try to understand this and build up from there. And the smallest system possible is two particles. And in our case, actually, we're working with bosons here. And so the, the, there's a subtlety for Laughlin state, so the, um, they're, they're always appearing at half flux. And so uh, the even denominators, one half, one quarter, are bosonids, are, are good for bosonic particles, and then the odd ones for fermions. Um, and so in our case, we're expecting to uh, reach the one half Laughlin state here, so one half flux, which means we have twice the number of flux quanta in the system compared to the number of particles. And that's um, what, what here where we are starting. So we're starting from a mod insulator, one particle on each of these lattice sites. So there's a small box. There's no harmonic potential. It's just a small box, four by four uh, sites, one particle on each side. And then we get rid of all the particles except for on those two sites. And then we start the state in the, as an initial state and we perform an adiabatic ramp such that the initial state is the ground state to a certain Hamiltonian, and then we change the Hamiltonian parameters such that this, this initial state remains the ground state throughout the entire evolution until the very end when we are ending up at the final Laughlin state. And then we can characterize this to, to snapshots, so we may take a lot of pictures of this final state, and or we, we prepare, take a picture, prepare again, take a picture, and so on. And from that, we can then characterize what a state looks like if it has the features that we expect from a Laughlin state. Um, we can even do something more. We can invert this final ramp and bring it back to its initial state. And then if we end up with the same initial state, that we, so with the same, same state that we started from, then we know that during this evolution, we actually stayed in the ground state, and we can also even more trust that these snapshots here were actually taken from a ground state. So there's a sense of showing that, yes, adiabaticity is indeed working in the system. Um, and these are the main results that we obtained here. So you can find on the left side, what would, uh, particularly top is experiment, bottom is a theoretical prediction. On the left side is a normal state, and we're looking here at the two-point correlation. So not at density, but the two-point correlations within these two particles. And you find on the left side that actually, yes, particles, they are happy to be at each, uh, they're happy to meet each other, so there's not a strong avoidance. Whereas on the right side, we can really find that particles tend to be away from another. So there's this, really this vortex structure. The particles tend to encircle one another. It's much, much more built into this right ray function. So here, down here is the radial average, and you find here this vortex core essentially in the two-body correlations. And again, I want to emphasize the wave function itself is actually flat. So similarly to this picture that I showed before with these many, many black dots, if you take, would take this picture many times and then average over them, it would be flat, right? It's just built in the correlations of the particles, but not in the actual wave function. So it's not a crystal per se, it's really just uh, a, a, a pattern that appears only in the correlation. And then we, we, we see exactly this pattern here in the, in the two-particle version of this. You can even go a little bit beyond that and um, actually verify that it's a one-half Laughlin state. So the one-half Laughlin state has, uh, we expect to have a, transport properties that correspond to a Laughlin 
state and uh, these transfer properties are uh, showing up in terms of the fraction con hall con conductivity, which you can probe by checking the variation of the bulk density with respect to the flux. And this is called Streeter's formula, so there's a variation of the bulk density, so if you increase your flux by a little bit, then the bulk density changes a little bit, um, it, it increases a little bit, and um, this increase is exactly proportional to the whole conductivity. So from the ground state properties, you can actually infer the transport properties of the state, and indeed it's consistent with having about uh, one half uh, of, of a fraction of whole conductivity, so that also fits with what you would expect from the Laplin state. Um, I also want to point out that we are now in exploring how to go to larger systems. So this is in, in uh, collaboration with uh, Tizian Vlads and uh, Annabel Bolt. So Tizian is also here in the audience if you want to learn more about this. He developed a Bayesian algorithm to actually optimize this preparation ramp that we were using. Um, and now we, with this ramp, we should be able to actually do the factor of 10 faster, which in turn also means that with this optimized ramp, we could now go to not four by four systems, but maybe eight by eight systems uh, should now be within the same time scale and reach. So we should be able to remain adiabatic because usually when you would go larger, then of course adiabaticity is harder to, um, to maintain. And um, uh, so if we can actually have an approved ramp, then with this now we should be able to get much larger systems. So that's very promising and um, something that we are excited to explore in the future. Yes? Mm -hmm. Exactly, yeah. And it's even a topological phase transition, which means it's very nicely, for, very well protect, protected. So you have to be very creative with your ramp to um, find a way that keeps the gap maximally open. So essentially, your finite size gap should be, you want to be always as large as possible given by your finite size. And um, that's easier for 4x4 than the 8x8 system, that, that's correct. Um, but that's, uh, that scales fairly favorable if you take, take the right ramp. So the trick is to have asymmetric tunneling during this ramp. So these are some details that I didn't talk about now. But there, there's an optimal ramp which actually allows you to reach the final state without an actual gap closing, but always a gap, an avoided crossing, which is, of course, limited by the finite, by the finite size of the system. Yeah. That's why it was so important for us to optimize this ramp before going to larger systems, because we only have a finite coherence time in these systems, particularly this, this um, artificial magnetic field um, is, an, is a driven system, so you have to be, make sure that you separate your energy scales and so well, which works, but you still have to, there's still a finite coherence time, which is on the order of 100 tunneling times, and if you want to be adiabatic with a gap that's on the order of, like, it's less than a, tu less than a tunneling energy, you have to be, you have to be careful, yeah. Mm. Yeah. But um, just to say that there are some promising new, um, new work in this direction, and um, this also motivates us to go to larger systems, and so in Vienna we are actually now building a system where one, goal of, one of the goals is to actually explore these systems, where the, the, this physics with, with larger systems. And um, what we want to do here is to, um, to uh, project the lattices um, in a more flexible way, which uh, will also enable us to have these fractional quantum hall systems in, in larger boxes. We are at the very early stages now, so here you can see a picture of the vacuum pump down that we, we did last week. We are also developing two, these tools for this um, uh, wavelength, uh, so holographic projection of these lattices, but um, yeah, these are very early stages, so, um, but I'm very, very excited to, that we hopefully soon will be able to, to just build on this work and, and uh, look at more physics uh, concerned, uh, concerning fractional quantum Hall states. Um, yeah, with this I would like to move to the last part of the talk, the non equilibrium dynamics. Um, are there more questions at this point, or shall we move on? Yes. Ah, um, a few hundred usually. Yeah, a few hundred, yeah. Um, in the end, most of these uh, things scale like one over square root n is your error bar. So if you want to have a, a reasonable data point, usually on the order of a few hundred starts to be interesting, yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, so to probe non-equilibrium dynamics, particularly in a more controlled way, we are making heavily use of the light shaping that uh, we ha had built into the system here. Um, and uh, so typically we start from the smart insulator as we also did for the preparation of the previous state. And then we apply local potentials to cut out certain regions um, in, within the smart insulator that will be our initial state. So here, for example, what, what you can do is get this uh, two by four system here as a starting point. All we did here was to create exactly one particle in each row and um, this, for example, we use this as a test and for calibration purposes and for, to check out the coherence in our system, but it's uh, kind of a cute little experiment, so I thought I'd just sh show it for you. So we have exactly one particle in each row, and these are, so these are copies. So there's no vertical tunneling, only horizontal tunneling. So as soon as we switch on the horizontal tunneling, we expect to have a quantum walk. 
And um, if we now tilt the system, then there's a dephasing that is proportional to the lattice side, so there will be a rephasing after a certain time, so particles tend to go back again. Of course, only if everything remains coherent. Um, it's kind of a real space analog of Bloch oscillations, if you like. Yeah? So you apply a force, in this case by a tilt, which is a potential gradient that we apply, and that now lets these particles to, um, to kind of oscillate, and after one uh, time scale, which is given by the energy difference between two sides, so after all sides would rephase, all particles would come back to the initial side. And indeed, that, that's what's happened. So here you can find snapshots after different evolution times. So they're spread out, and then after some time, they come back to the initial site almost perfectly. And that shows us that it's a very coherent process, and we can let these run for, for lo long times, up to about a second. So that's, um, that's, that's, that's uh, one thing we can do with these, with these systems. In this case, this is uh, really a, a single particle quantum walk. And now it becomes, of course, more complex once these quantum walks are not performed from a single particle, but actually from multiple particles at the same time. So um, think of uh, starting of a one-dimensional system now with one particle on each lattice side. We're in the repulsive Bose-Hubbard model, so particles like to hop on neighboring sides. They can occupy, many particles can occupy each side, and we have on-site repulsion. And um, we start from a completely pure state, so we know that each side has exactly one particle, and we know that the state is globally pure, um, so globally pure and locally pure in that sense. Now, as we let the system evolve after a certain time, these particles have tunneled around, so we are in an entangled state, which now locally does not look pure anymore. So locally, this should approach now a thermal statistics. So for example, for the observable of the number of particles I would detect on a given lattice site, I would expect a, a distribution that follows a statistical ensemble. Um, and uh, at the same time, of course, we still have this globally pure state, so the system has followed a unitary dynamics, so I know my global state remains pure. Um, we can actually check that the state is glo globally pure by interfering it with the copy, and you find that um, the purity remains indeed constant over time, and is essentially unity. And you can also look at this purity on subsystems, which then essentially is the, uh, the, the Rini entropy of these subsystems, and you find that very quickly they reach their thermal equilibrium, and then the this entanglement entropy remains constant. And if you look at larger subsystems, okay, it takes a little longer, and there's some finite size oscillations. So these are, these are some things one can do to probe whether your system is thermal or not. Um, also, also um, um, mutual information can, can, can be probed in the systems. Um, and we were wondering if one can actually use this kind of dynamics because it explores a lot of your Hilbert space. Maybe there's a way to efficiently use this to actually learn the Hamiltonian in which you are. Um, and that's a work that we've done in collaboration with um, Agnes Valenti um, and Eliska um, and, uh, and uh, Sebastian Huber. Um, so uh, it was, uh, she was also here, you, you heard a talk probably yesterday. Um, so the idea is that you use this non-equilibrium dynamics to have an efficient way to figure out the parameters of your Hamiltonian. And indeed, uh, even with a Bayes, Bayes uh, algorithm, you can be fairly, fairly good. But uh, if you do use a neural network, you actually, just with a reasonable number of, of snapshots, you can get uh, knowledge about the Hamiltonian parameters down to the promil level, which is very encouraging to us because these are some of the big, big problems. Uh, well, the, it's, it's, it's something that is difficult to calibrate sometimes, to actually know exactly the parameter of your Hamiltonian is typically something that reaching a percent level is, is, is fairly difficult. It's, e it's, it's easier to keep your system stable than actually to know your individual parameters. So this is just a very nice way how, how we can get our um, system, calibration of the system essentially for free from, from these snapshots. Um, now the next step that we were applying, uh, that we were, were going here was to introduce disorder into the system. And we know that this picture of, of thermalization um, and, and locally thermal and globally pure, that this should fail as soon as we go into a strongly, repuls uh, strongly uh, disordered system. There's this um, concept of many-body localization that um, occur occurs here, so essentially particles start to become localized because all their, um, uh, all their hoppings are exponentially suppressed, so all these amplitudes of, of actually moving away, they're exponentially suppressed, so particles remain exponentially localized. And um, there's this prediction, um, uh, many-body localization tells us that also in the limit of in, uh, interaction, interacting systems, although there are more many-body resonances, I should still remain exponentially local. So we have two competing exponentials here, right? We have on the one hand, we have Anderson localization, which would tell us particles should remain exponentially localized. On the other hand, we have an exponentially growing Hilbert space now, uh, because we have not only more particles, but also interactions. So the question is, they compete, and how do they compete, and who, which one does win? And uh, the framework of many-body localization tells us that, yes, uh, actually what wins is the, is the, the localization. And over the recent years, this, has, this view has shifted a little bit, and now over very long times, we believe that maybe there is still a little bit of delocalization going on, but on shorter time scales, uh, uh, there indeed uh, is uh, uh, localization is predicted. 
Um, and this also means that we are now in a system where statistical physics fails because we are not exploring the entire Hubble space in the system anymore, although we are very, very far away from equilibrium. There's a lot of energy in the system. We would like to explore the entire Hubble space, but there is destructive interference that we would do so, many, uh, destructive interference of the many body processes in the system that prevents us from doing that. And um, to our knowledge, it's really the only system that does not do that. So many body localization is really the exception to the rule, um, the exception to this paradigm of, of, uh, of uh, quantum thermalization. So it's very interesting to understand the conditions that are necessary to actually do so. Um, so in our system, the way we probed this was very similar to the previous experiments, except that now what we do is that we, um, we apply disorder to the system, a yeah, very strong disorder. And uh, here what we do is we calculate now the, um, the classical entropy um, of the half chain. So essentially we count particles in one half of our system, and if that remains uh, at a constant value, that means there's no more tunneling going on over the barrier. Yeah? So we count the particles on the left side here, then we compute Pn log Bn to compute the entropy associated with that, and then uh, we see that really here on, on a logarithmic scale here, these are many orders of magnitude of threat, on a lo logarithmic scale very quickly we reach a, a plateau here. So from 10 to 100 tunneling times, essentially nothing happens anymore. Um, and then we can also look at more complex processes in the system, because there is still, there are still interactions present in the system, so, so there should be some difference to a non-interacting system. And it turns out that this difference um, uh, manifests itself through dephasing of these localized particles. So think of one particle being in a localized orbital here, another one here. They're still talking to each other through these exponential tails because they're just exponentially localized. So um, exponentially suppressed processes will actually lead to entanglement between different particles. And that should, um, should show up as an exponentially, uh, as a logarithmically slow growth of the entanglement entropy in the system. And in our system here, we probe the quantity that's related to the entanglement, entanglement entropy. Um, and um, what you indeed find is this here, there's a log scale again. So we find this logarithmic growth of the entanglement entropy in the system um, consistent with this picture of, of a slow formation of entanglement that's non-local in the system. Yeah. Um, so this was the, the, the second ob observation here in the system. Um, now, uh, we went farther than that now and asked, okay, what happens in between? How can we characterize now the, the thermal region and this localized region? So as a function of disorder strength, for weak disorder, we know that the system should thermalize. For strong disorder, we know that it's localized. So what happens in between? And are there maybe some observables that should peak there? Not something that just goes down or so, but actually what tells us where the critical point should be? What tells us at which point am I thermal, at which point am I not? And um, what we uh, uh, looked into was um, the higher order correlation functions in the system. So we said, okay, the state should be the most complex in the middle because we know many body localization is weakly entangled. It grows only logarithmically slow a little bit, so it's a weakly entangled state. A thermal state is also a simple state because all the correlations are completely uh, uh, shoved into the global degrees of freedom. So the, the critical state should be the com most complex one in terms of its many body, uh, its many body uh, uh, correlations. And so here we compute the multi-order correlation functions, the connected correlation functions of two, three, four, five, and so on order, and tr check how strong are they, they as a function of the disorder strength. And what we find is, uh, th this is the result here. So here, uh, the blue is the strongly uh, disordered regime, and the yellow is the weakly disordered regime, and in both cases we find that the second order correlation functions are present, but everything else is very quickly decaying and uh, becomes essentially negligible to describe my state. And in the intermediate regime with a strong, uh, with intermediate disorder, I see that the higher order correlation functions, they stay high. So the, the, the circles are the data points and the bars are the theory. So indeed we have good, good agreement with the theory that the higher order correlations matter. And we went here up to the eighth order. It was essentially what we could, could compute on the laptop. Um, they, are, they, they are really relevant. We need them to describe the state. And they are really peaking at this intermediate disorder strength. Um, <clears throat> and uh, also here we um, were trying to understand this a little bit better with machine learning techniques. Um, what does it mean to thermalize? And how can we maybe narrow down this critical point a little bit better? This was in collaboration with Annabel Bort at, at, uh, at Regensburg. Um, and we tried several techniques. Um, um, for example, just simple classification. We also start, uh, try to understand, uh, to, to learn the dynamics by essentially asking a network whether the, it can still distinguish the state from a thermal state, and if it can't distinguish it, then we, it would be a thermal state. Um, so that was um, another method, and we also tried a confusion method that was uh, pioneered by, by Abbott, who is, I think, I don't know if he's already here, but uh, uh, he's, he, will, he will be here. Um, 
where, uh, yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a different technique where you essentially um, guess whether there should be a critical point or not, and, not, and from that, in an unbiased way, try to distill your critical point. And uh, these are just different approaches that we try to under understand our data better, and that allowed us to narrow down this critical point without going into the higher order correlation uh, functions. Um, we are now going beyond this and trying to engineer in Vienna in a new experiment as non-local correlations in a more direct way, and instead of actually waiting exponentially long times, we are doing this by uh, mediating the, uh, the, the these, uh, inter entanglement, these interactions between the particles over non-local, di uh, over, over long distances through, through light, and uh, so this is through an optical cavity that we have built around uh, individually addressable and detectable atoms, and now this light field now allows us to, uh, to, to Connect, connect any any other any particle with any other particle in the system. Um, in this case, we can even switch them on and off through this uh, single addressing. So you can, in a programmable way, uh, let these atoms interact um, throughout this entire system. So this non-local couplings, you can even do this dynamically, switches on and off. Um, it also allows to, you to do um, non-destructive measurements, for example, for um, error correction protocols or for um, new observables, so like weekly weekly uh, perturbative measurements. Um, and also this allows us now to be much faster compared to these uh, quantum gas microscope measurements that I've shown you before. <clears throat> this is what it uh, looked like uh, before we put optics around the setup. So there's our vacuum chamber here. Just to show a little bit of the, of the update, here's our um, little cavity that we put into the vacuum. Um, we are operating in the regime of strong coupling between each individual atom to the light field. So not a colla collaborative effect, but each atom individually is strongly coupled to the light field. And uh, here uh, we are then, uh, trapping these atoms in a tweezer array uh, that we load from a, from a uh, 3D mod. <coughs> so it's a, that, that allows us to be into much faster. <laughs> Um, yeah, so with this, um, I would like to close. Uh, you can uh, find a summary here. So we, uh, I, I talked to, to you about the solid state phenomena, particularly for the fractional quantum Hall effect that we were able to observe for the first time in optical lattices now here. Um, in, uh, in, in particular, this vortex structure that really shows us that the true prediction of Laughlin is also what we find here. Um, and then uh, that we uh, were engineering this or measuring this uh, entanglement dynamics in, in non-equilibrium non systems, in a, both in the thermal states and in the non-thermal states, and um, trying to understand a little bit more the conditions that, that you need to, to get there. Um, so this is the team that I've had the pleasure to work with here, the team at Harvard and the group of Marcus Greiner, um, and uh, the theory collaborators that helped us a lot to understand and, and, and uh, interpret these data in a better way, and this was a really fruitful collaboration. And uh, here's the new team at TOV um, that I'd also have the pleasure to work with now for two years almost. Um, yeah, and thank you all for your attention. Okay, thank you, Julian, for the very nice talk. Ah. <laughs> I'm here. Uh, please go on with questions. Uh, <coughs> you are in list, don't worry. Thank you very much. Uh, so in the kind of one of the last slides, you mentioned that you can now also like uh, probe like longer range systems and stuff like that. Uh, generally, for long-range systems, uh, ion traps are considered like a much better option. So how does it compare in simulating like uh, power law, decay interactions, and stuff like that uh, mm -hmm. with this? Um, yeah, so indeed there's some, there's some similarities with, with ion traps um, in this kind of setup to have them in a the string and then mediating the interactions, in our case, not through phonons, but through photons. I think the difference is that we don't use the photons to trap the atoms simultaneously. So in an ion trap, the photon or the phonons are essentially the trap, and the phonons, the motion, are coupled, right? So, and that's, uh, that's exactly what limits the, the ion traps to actually still have these simulations going on uh, in, a, in a faithful way when you, when you go larger and larger. So I hope that with this system, by splitting this off, by having fixed individual atoms that are at, at fixed positions trapped through light fields that are not the light fields that you use for talking to each other, we actually have a bit more control. We are also not limited to power law interactions, but actually we can go to, to any, any, kind of, any, any kind of, so we are not, not within this range of, what is it, uh, 0.8 to 2.7 or something. They have this, they have this, they have this I, I don't want to give a wrong number here, but they have this range where they, where they feel comfortable, right? Um, and I think we, are, we in principle can go to any other range. We could also even think of, of an interaction that would increase and decrease with distance. So you're not really limited to any power law even. So there, there's, there's more flexibility, but of course we are just pioneering this right now. It's not working yet, so. Uh, uh, we will see. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
So, uh, thank for the very nice talk. Uh, I was wondering that plot, the 3D plot that you show the, the different regimes for the multipartite correlation, yeah. multiparticle correlation. I don't know if you could just go back there yeah, because yeah, yeah. it's easier to explain. This one here? Yes, exactly. Yeah. So, when you mentioned the critical uh, behavior that you, you yeah. find that it's still high, but I was wondering whether it's important the fact that it's non monotonic in the very end. Mm. If it's there some. Yes, it's, that's a good question. Some um, specific one phase transition there. We've asked us our, us ourselves maybe we already see the onset of the finite sites here because these were 12 particles on 12 sites. So it could be that this is already like kind of the global distribution of freedom in which you put some into your information because it's a finite evolution time, right? We are always probing here at the finite evolution time. In this case, after 100 tunneling times, which is much, much longer than you need for the thermal and the MBL charge sector to, 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 to stabilize, but in the intermediate region, you are not there yet, right? Because it, otherwise it would not be, like, yeah, it, it takes very long. And, um, and so we are, we are wondering if that would be a reason, but I think it's not 100% understood. <coughs> Are there other questions, comments? So I, I have one. Uh, you know, do you know the, that now there is this quarrel if MBL exists or not? Uh, does your experiment uh, help to clarify this point? Yeah, we actually did another experiment on exactly this question, which I did not want to talk today about because I thought that's, that's a bit too much information. <laughs> um, um, but there, there are, so the, on, the, on the theory side, I think there has been a little bit of a shift over the last years, and the critical point has been moved upwards by, I don't know, a factor every year. I think now we are somewhere at 1,000 instead of five or so, so things go up. Um, and we believe that there's no true MBL in the low, in the low disorder regime, which where low means below 1,000 tunneling energies or something like this. Um, so it's not quite clear if there could be a regime at super, super high disorder strength or if there's actually no true MBL at all. Now, when I say no true MBL, I mean that, uh, that there's still charge motion on the double log scale, so very, very slow very extremely, it's not only exponentially slow, but actually <laughs> very, very slow, yeah? And so that's something that experimentally, I think you would not be able to address in this limit. Now, the dominant factor that is believed to cause this very slow uh, dynamics is called the avalanche dynamics. So essentially what happens there is that you have a small local uh, thermal bubble, and that will help you now to, to delocalize the neighboring spin or the neighboring site. And the larger now this local bubble becomes, so the local thermal bubble, it acts as a bath always to the neighbor, and then you have this avalanche process that um, destabilizes side by side your entire system eventually. And so that would mean one bubble is enough to destabilize everything, and it, it's just a question of uh, stochastically how often do you have these bubbles, and that's suppressed with this order, but it's always there. And um, we were looking into this mechanism whether we can kind of artificially create such a bubble and then look at the dynamics, and we did could see that there was this avalanche dynamic, dynamics happening. So in that sense, we can contribute to this, um, but seeing this log-log dynamics over very long scales, I think, is something that, like what you would expect in a really strongly disordered system, long, 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 like really big, I think that's something that experimentally will not be addressable in the near future, also not theoretically. But these, these, uh, these idealized models where you can understand the processes, I think that's something where we have already and also in the future there may be more experiments on the, along these lines, yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Okay. So, uh, let's thank Julian again.